Director for the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And uh, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of One City, One Book this year. Our book celebration. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Louder. Yeah. <laughs> um, the book selection, Yes Chef, a memoir by Marcus Samuelson, um, was a fascinating read for me into his life's journey, and I hope many of you enjoyed the book and have read it. Um, and because Walnut Creek is home to so many cuisines and great restaurants, we thought it would be meaningful to hear the stories of some of our own local notable chefs. And we are pleased to bring um, the chef's panel tonight um, and present it to you. We also have outside on the table, if you haven't picked one up, um, favorite recipes that the chefs have provided for you to take home. And I'm pleased now to introduce Jackie Burrell. She is the moderator for the evening. She's the editor and senior writer for Eat, Drink, Play, the Bay Area News Group's Guide to Bay Area Food, Wine, Craft Beer, and West Coast Travel. And her column appears in the Contra Costa Times, Oakland Tribune, and the San Jose Mercury News every Sunday. I'm going to turn it over to Jackie, and she's going to introduce our panel of chefs. After the presentation, we're going to take um, a few questions from the audience. And please join me in welcoming Jackie and the panel of chefs. Thank you so much for having me and us. I was really excited to be asked and delighted to have this panel here. We've got Kevin Weinberg from the Walnut Creek Yacht Club. Hi. Yeah, one of my favorite restaurants and I was, as I just told him, thrilled to see that clam chowder recipe in here because that thing is the best. I'm Paramita Roy from Kanishka's. And if you haven't been there yet, it's right near the Walnut Creek Yacht Club. It's globally inspired, kind of tavern fare that's Indian inspired. Great food, great wine, very fun food. And then Claudio Ricciolini from 54 Mint. And that one's in the city. In, he's got one over in Concord in the Trader Joe's area. And then um, Forno, which is just what, two blocks from here? Yeah, on Locust. Yeah, on Locust, which is uh, pizza, pasta, killer porchetta sandwiches, pastries. Yes, yes, and as, as we were talking about earlier, the trick is you need to go out and get exercise, so you're going to hike over to the bakery and pick up your pastries. So um, I wanted to start off by asking how many people have read the book? Excellent. There's a test at the end. I don't know if anyone mentioned that to you. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the themes from the book. Um, culture, community, uh, food, obviously, and how that all comes together. So I'm going to lead off. I'm going to throw some questions out this way. And then when we get around 8 o'clock, we'll take any questions you guys may have. Um, but of course, if there's something super pressing and you start doing the, oh, 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 I will call on you. Um, Kevin, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to cooking and your style of food. Oh, uh, well, it's a long story. Good, we've um, got an hour. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we're working on a book about it. Um, I started cooking, I, I went to high school here in, La, in Walnut Creek in Las Lomas, and I started cooking then. Um, I was the only guy in the, the home ec class <laughs> in uh, 11th, and I took it again in 12th grade. Um, I, not quite sure what drew me to it when I was even younger. I remember I would watch the Galloping Gourmet when I came home from school. Uh, Julia Child's show was on then. Um, experiences like that, just fascinated with food. It was all pre sort of the, the, the celebrity chef or the culinary superstar and all that kind of stuff, Food Network. Um, there, there was a picture of me younger watching the turkey roast in the oven like it was a TV show and I just pulled up a chair. But I, I, one of the things that stands out as a bigger memory is I, I had an Italian neighbor that uh, looked after me. I was probably in the fourth grade or fifth grade and I was staying over there at their house and she had made a Parmesan cheese souffle and I was just watching the whole process, mixing, whipping the stuff. I had no idea what was going on into the oven and out came this thing that smelled so good. It was all, I was like, that's like magic. And pretty much since then, I, you know, I kept, I've never had a, a job that was other than cooking. 
Love it. Paramita. So I'm Paramita Roy. I'm the chef and the owner of Kanishka's Neo Indian Gastropub. And um, I'm originally from Calcutta, India. And I have a story uh, behind the opening of Kanishka's. So um, my, you know, I have a big passion and creative uh, behind my uh, concept of cooking. So my whole family, especially my grandfather's house, used to be a whole house of entertainment. And every weekend we used to go to his house and he used to spin around his, you know, um, his creative with, you know, over braised uh, meats and, you know, colonial style of cooking and invite guests over and entertain with scotch and beer. And, you know, we used to just, you know, we used to have guests like, you know, personal family members to festivals like, you know, like 100, 200 people and I was just like amazed and and my mother used to also like you know my own person my house used to have parties like that and it dived me into the creativity of starting spinning on you know being as a teenager and I started cooking um, being at high school for my brother and some of my small group of members and I wanted to as I grew up I wanted to open a restaurant so as I came to the country to this country uh, for my undergrad and my career took a different direction, more into information technology, and <laughs> totally different, you know. <laughs> and then, but that didn't stop me uh, from cooking. You know, I still uh, just like you to say, like you know, I think all of you do. You watch Food Network, right? <laughs> You're into shows like who's going to be the next Food Network star. <laughs> so I used to do the same. And my friends used to inspire me, you know, you should apply for that. I said, okay, one day I will, you know, it's like, you know, I'm going to open my restaurant and I'm going to do that perhaps. Or I'm going to open my restaurant and take my restaurant to be the next steps. And um, so I um, took one thing at a time. I got a, I uh, nourished myself. I you know, did a lot of catering events, you know, been in LA, and I got a big break, actually. I moved from LA to New York. I catered in um, big uh, Ben's fashion shows, brought in my cuisine from Tapa Style, and I apprenticed myself, um, you know, as from the business operational training with, uh, and, uh, with big restaurateurs, and then came down to the Bay Area, and then um, completely, you know, one thing's happened to the other, and opened Kanishka's, um, which is named after my 11-year-old um, son, my namesake, and nourished my dream. And one thing is leading to another at this point. That's Leaving one. my passion. It's wonderful. Good. Claudio. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Claudio Ricciolini, uh, and I am Italian. Maybe my accent can tell you that. <laughs> okay. yeah. So I come from a small region uh, in Italy, in the center of Italy. Uh, Italy has 20 regions, and I am in Perugia, close by Perugia. It's a small town, probably 65,000 inhabitants. It's called Foligno. It's like Warner Creek. <laughs> and um, passion uh, through my mother, basically. Uh, I remember when I used to do my homework, and I used to be in the kitchen on the dinner table. My mother, she used to make pasta. She used to look at me if I was doing proper. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes she used to hit me. I know that no nowadays you cannot do that. They will arrest you. But, you know, it was, it was given with, with a lot of love to me. So uh, basically that's where I start to, to love, my, to love um, cooking and food. Uh, my background, basically, it's hotel industry. I have been working for uh, several uh, hotel chain, and I, I was working also for uh, Sheraton ITT first, and after Starwood Hotels and Resort. They are familiar to you guys, for sure. So I worked for Sheraton, for Westin. Uh, I went to London, Middle East. I worked in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in Lebanon. I was specialized in opening hotels. So when you open an hotel, you have to also to open the food and beverage outlets. So I was making a, a lot of research in new concepts, and I was always uh, um, very curious. You know, I was trying to give, uh, since uh, they were international hotels, to give some of the local cuisine and plus 
what the company was asking me to do, you know, Tex, Mex, Italian, <laughs> French. Anyhow, I have to say proudly that all the restaurants that I have opened in, the, in these hotels, they are still working and they are very successful. So for me, it's a very good thing. San Francisco, I came here in 2008. I sold everything in Italy. I came here with my wife, two kids and two dogs at the age of 54. Now I am 61. Uh, I am proudly say that I am a successful businessman because in uh, seven years I opened three restaurants. All of three they are very successful and I am very happy. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that really struck me in the book is how much um, cooking and nourishing other people and cooking for other people creates a community within the restaurant kitchen and then within the greater community too. Um, tell us, Claudio, about the people who work in your kitchen. Well, um, San Francisco, Concord, and, um, and here in uh, Wonlu Creek, I have a head chef, they're all from Italy, with a visa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, even some sous chef they are from Italy uh, the other people they have been trained you know we do follow a very simple cuisine because of the power of the Italian cuisine is made by the simplicity mm -hmm. um, we have a very simple dishes we don't put a lot of ingredients when we create a dish you can see even on my, on my recipe that I proposed to you there are five uh, ingredients, no more than that. So the, the most important thing, I think, is to, to be real, <coughs> to, to do what you do with, uh, with love, to pull out all your uh, knowledge, and to use uh, fresh and fine ingredients. Don't make shortcuts. It's not, uh, it's not nice. <laughs> Kevin, tell us about the people in your kitchen. Uh, we have <clears throat> probably about 20 kitchen staff all together. I have people in my, my crew that have been, we've been open for 18 years in Walnut Creek. Wow. Um, it's a pretty long time for a restaurant, uh, in the restaurant business. Um, and I have several people that have been with me the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. One of my guys in the daytime has been there since we opened. I have two, two guys that have been 12, 14 years. Um, and two chefs that have stayed with me for 10, 11 years and then moved on. Well, one of the things is, as you were talking about, sort of a community. It's, there's a lot of uh, organization and trying to get people together to work as a team uh, for a common cause. And, you know, you have the business rush. And we can do upwards of, you know, 250 plus covers in a given night. And it's a lot of people and it's a lot of food. <coughs> coming out, the prep work that's involved. In the, the culinary side of the kitchen, you know, it goes back, there's an old history and back to the Scoffier's period where it's a military brigade type <laughs> organization and you have, you know, the executive chef, which would be like the general, and then you have sous chefs and then you have chef de parties and commis down the line of people and everybody has to do a certain job in order to win the battle, so to speak. Um, and, you know, at the end, the chef has got the final say. And when you're a chef owner, you, you have even more at stake uh, than just, you know, you're working for someone else. You know, you want your, your reputations at stake. You, you have, we have a lot of regular guests. Many I see some familiar faces. Um, we've been coming for a long time. So, you know, you don't, want, you don't want to let anybody down. So you're saying that in the kitchen at Walnut Creek Yacht Club, everyone comes in uniform and they... <laughs> um, well, we have a uniform that everybody um, yeah. needs to wear. That you know, that, that uh, you know, we stick to the culinary uniform, and mm -hmm. uh, we have hats instead of the the tall hats. Um, but uh, I'm picky about it that you have your apron on, you have your your jacket on, and we're yeah. visible um, to the to the guests. And each guy that's in charge of his station is in charge of his station, but there's somebody in charge of him, and then there's me, and I'll dictate to my lieutenants. This needs to be fixed, or that needs to be changed, or that wasn't right last night. Let's try this, and I'll ask for ideas. And just you know, I, 
usually the person that's doing the job has more information about what could help. So we all kind of work together to, to make it happen. Yeah. How about you? So we have uh, six people in the kitchen. Not, we have a linear kitchen, we have a small kitchen. So it's not, not everybody is working at the same time. And everybody's <laughs> stationed at each, you know, uh, like uh, at each station. So someone is either working at the grill or the saute station, at the pantry or the dishwashing. And the cuisine is, is, is complicated. So my cuisine is, you know, is, is a global inspired cuisine with Indian flavors. It's, um, it's constantly evolving and it's got a lot of ingredients. So the biggest challenge for me is to, first of all, make sure that everybody understands through the different spices. You know, my kitchen has probably got, I think the first thing was when I first opened, when someone walked into the kitchen, they saw that you've got the spices from top to bottom and it was not just Indian spices, it was like spices from all over the world. I, you know, wherever I traveled and the spices keeps changing and that's where it, you know, it's not that I myself have to train the ongoing changing staffs. They just have to keep up with it, the front of the house and the back of the house. It's a list, ongoing list. It's about like 30 to 40 different kind of spices and ingredients that goes on different dishes. And so, um, and I'm extremely picky about, you know, the taste and, um, and consistency. Um, so, you know, so as a first time restaurant, you know, this is my first restaurant. And even though I've, you know, I've worked in different restaurants, done the business side of the training, when you're jumping yourself, you know, in your first restaurant and making sure the nights that you are not, you might, I, when I'm not working at the restaurant, you're relying on your sous chef to execute the cuisine for you and hence making sure the, you know, the line, you know, he's accountable, the line is making sure they're executing, you know, so everybody make, you know, is consistent that every single food gets delivered in the same presentation when it's sent out to the table. And that is an ongoing challenge. I know that chefs and especially chef owners put in terrible hours. Um, Claudio was mentioning having a restaurant is like having a second wife or third or fourth. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we say in Italy. <laughs> Um, one, of the, one of the things I thought was very telling in the book was when Marcus Samuelson mentions that his editor wants him to do a book on how Marcus cooks at home, and he thinks that's hilarious. He says chefs don't cook at home. They're never home. Um, do you cook at home? Yes, I do. What do you cook at home? Simple dishes. Uh, usually when my kids are, mm, are at home, uh, I, they ask for pasta all the times, so they want to, you know, new, new sauces, and uh, it's very simple. You know, for for the Italians, it's very important when you sit down uh, around the table because you have time to talk about what happened during your day. You know, mm -hmm. so I can talk to my kids, to my wife if she's there. And uh, it's a very, it's a convivial, so you're going to enjoy that. Usually they want, uh, they want also some American dishes, you know, they like very much hamburgers because they came here when they were <coughs> eight, now Roberto is almost uh, 17, 18 years old. So they are used to also a very international uh, cuisine because they came with me all over, Middle East, so they know what is Arabic food uh, from, Indian food, you know, Chinese food. So they are very, very uh, open-minded in terms of food. But we do Italian food uh, probably 80% at home. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, do you cook at home? Very little. <laughs> I know um, all my home sort of is the restaurant too, so yeah. I'm always cooking there. Um, at home, home, um, where I sleep, uh, I do, uh, I like to make sandwiches, uh, I like charcuterie, uh, put it between some bread and, you know, oil, vinegar, all that stuff, I'm good, I can make all kinds of great sandwiches, um, and breakfast, uh, you know, even at night when I get home from work, I'll make, you know, potatoes, eggs, stuff like that, it's, 
Uh, and, and my family gets together a lot on Sundays, mm -hmm. and um, that's a, our, my family's very food driven uh, family, and so it's always a big deal, and there's either it's a birthday or whatever, or even it's just Sunday when uh, everyone sort of is off, and then, so we'll come together, and I'll cook for the family. I always do Thanksgiving. We've had Thanksgiving in the restaurant for 18 years, so it <laughs> makes it easy to not mess up somebody's house. Uh, <laughs> you can come in, and, and you've got a dishwasher, and all my nieces and nephews have grown up in the restaurant, and... Uh, you know, they know how to run the dishwasher. They know how to set the tables. They've all worked in there but while they got ready to go to college. Um, so, yeah, Thanksgiving in the restaurant has been a pretty annual event, but we, and I cook that. I love it. I love it. The spice, I know I'm supposed to ask you that same question, but I, if you don't mind my, like, leaping forward. The thing about the spices, I just find so interesting. There's a whole chapter in the book where he's... He's going through the spices and trying to figure out what's in a spice blend just by smelling it. When you're playing around with spices and creating a new dish and you're drawing from all these inspirations, how do you go about that? So I come up with spices based on, you know, if I'm, when I'm traveling to a different country and I come up with, you know, I, I, you know, I go by, you know, the flavors that I really have enjoyed. Like, you know, for, for example, I can travel to Jamaica. And I really enjoyed uh, like a coastal, uh, like a braised meat dish. And I want to translate that dish and I want to bring it, whether to my restaurant or home. I don't want to want to replicate the exact flavor, but I want to infuse that flavor. First, what the way I do, I research on that, you know, the way I do is like, you know, I, I meet the, you know, I taste the dish. And I try to uh, talk with the uh, chef or the you know the street uh, the you know the vendor who wherever I tasted it and I try to really taste what was in the dish whether it was cumin paprika you know the peppercorn I try to dig myself garlic and then you know try to make that blend and then I start infusing the Indian flavors you know my own creativity to add on you know an, another level of it. So it's like, you know, when I create recipes, it's, it's like writing a fiction cookbook. That's what it is. It's, you know, sometimes it comes to, you know, like a month of coming up with amazing recipes and some of the best recipes comes out in a second. And sometimes it's like a writer's block. I would mm -hmm. be staring at a window and nothing would be coming out. Or sometimes I would go on a drive, reading, you know, listening to good music and I come up with some of the best recipes. I mean, for example, I mean, the lamb sliders, I mean, the mm -hmm. lamb sliders, which the guests find out my best recipe. I came up with that recipe in my New York um, apartment. There was nothing in the fridge. You know, there was a few herbs and I had few um, spices and my mother was visiting me from India. And I had the ground lamb and I went down to the uh, grocery downstairs and I grabbed some ground lamb. And I, had, and I really got some really good brioche. Um, so I was like, okay, let me put some, you know, something. So I started mixing and, you know, with my creativity, some spice blend. You know, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So I thought like, okay, here's what we could do, a spice blend of herbs and some spices. Thinking about, you know, some, a flair of um, Lucknowi cuisine and some Middle Eastern, you know, flair to it. So that's how, you know, it was just writing like fictional things just going on in my mind. And that was one of the best things that came out. And my mother told me, like, when you would open uh, your restaurant, this is something you should put it out, you know, on the menu. And apparently I did. I did a take on an open space brioche that night when I fed my mama. And today I'm serving, you know, on a flatbread. That's cool. That's how I do it. I like that. Claudio, have yeah. you been back to Italy since you left? Oh, yes, every year. Every year. I think that it's very important that you go back because otherwise you're going to lose the palate. Mm -hmm. Not because you eat not good in, in USA, it's because it's very important that you go back and you start to, I say to, to my American friends, I'm going to have an injection again of the Italian culture because it keeps you 
uh, alive, especially when you have to transmit the, the um, you know new ideas or new dishes uh, to to your customer, and they will appreciate. We do change menu every month mm -hmm. in San Francisco, in uh, in Concord, and here in Wano Creek. So people they expect you that you present something new. If you stay with the same menu, one month, two months, three months. I think it's not nice. I know that you're going to keep the food cost low because, you know, your inventory, you can manage it in a good way. But you have to bring new dishes. You have to be able to communicate what you're doing. And the Italian cuisine, it's very simple. Nowadays, of course, because I do base of whatever we present as a traditional, regional, typical cuisine. So few ingredients. They give you fantastic uh, aroma, fantastic taste. Uh, and uh, I think this is the, the power, the strength of, of the Italian cuisine. You know, if you go south of Italy, you use less ingredients. You know, it's a very poor cuisine. They use olive oil, tomato, and that's it. As soon as you go a little <laughs> bit, yeah. As soon as you go further up central you know it starts to be a little bit richer if you go up north after bologna you start to see the butter if you go to torino you are very close to france so you, you get the, the influence of uh, of um, north of europe but you know there are few rules uh, in the italian cuisine that they are basic just to give you an idea when you do a, a tomato sauce uh, if you do extra virgin olive oil, onion, and tomato, and basil, you can put parmigiano. But if you do extra virgin olive oil, garlic, tomato, and parsley, no parmigiano, never. There are some exceptions where you use pecorino cheese, you know, in certain, uh, in certain area. But these are basically simple rules that uh, we follow. Never realized that. <laughs> the Italian cooking police are going to come after me. <laughs> so, do you have rules for your internal rules for your style of cooking? I have, there's probably some, you know, internal rules. You, try, you know, try to be true to the ingredients. Um, don't mess around so much with too much stuff, and try to keep. Um, you know, I, I look at food a lot in creating dishes, not only, you know, the dish itself, but how does it sound when I say it to someone or, or when someone reads it on a menu? Mm -hmm. Does it sound appetizing? Does it sound interesting? Does it sound confusing? Does it sound like it's all over the place? I often will tell my cooks when we're putting together a dish, you might have five or six things coming together, garnishes and so forth, and I'll, I'll say, mm -hmm. now who wasn't invited to this party? <laughs> who can who can leave and and the dish can still stand on its own and you can lose one or two things and then you finally get down and now you had eight things now you only have five and and the dish is, has more integrity and when you say it then to somebody you know you're only you, you don't have to give the recipe but you can say oh it has this and this and this or you know, I can, you can, in coming up with the way we're describing a dish on the menu, describe it one way, and we, make, we sell 10. And describe it, change a word around or change the order of words, and the next night we can sell 30. Just That's by the so way funny. that it, 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 it reads, the way that you say it, can make a dish more enticing or more um, appetizing. Huh. There was a thing, I don't know if you guys remember in the book, where he was talking about experimenting with wasabi in the potatoes in like the early 2000s, I guess, and that people in New York got very freaked out by the word wasabi. And so he just called it horseradish. Yeah. And then they were like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm good with that. So, yeah. That's true. Also, you know, I mean, people are, are, are far more food savvy today than they were, you know, 20 years ago even. Um, mm -hmm. But not everybody is a foodie, or not everybody knows, you know, all of the culinary terms are, are you know, even something as simple as wasabi. I mean, people from, from Iowa might not even know what an avocado is. But you, it's, uh, you have to be realistic when you know, I'm describing, if I'm describing a culinary term. Not everybody knows what to confit means. Mm 
So if I put something into the definition or to the description, and I'm not catering to a particular somebody or a group that I know knows what I'm talking about, um, it won't sell. People people are not af are often afraid to say to the server, "Oh, so what exactly is Ras al Hanout?" And well, if I said Moroccan spice blend, well, most everybody knows Morocco. <laughs> and they can kind of figure it out from there. Now, <laughs> Ras al Hanout is a very popular blend of spices, you know, used in Moroccan or Middle Eastern cooking. So that's just a simple example of changing something around so people can find it more comfortable. Yeah. To uh, now, if you're going to a to a very well known high end fine dining experience, one because you're going there, you're probably if, uh, have a higher level of f food appreciation or restaurant, uh, you know, the whole understanding. So your vocabulary is probably larger, you've read books, you watch the Food Network and so forth. But if you're just coming out to dinner, you don't necessarily need an education from your server or from the menu or you want to feel like, I don't know what this stuff is. You know, mm -hmm. what am I doing here? Um, and so it makes people feel uncomfortable and we try to make people feel comfortable. And educate you along the way. Our staff is very knowledgeable about everything that we serve and do. If we use an ingredient or a term, there's a reason for it. And then we want the, the guests to be able to understand or the server to explain why that is. When you're doing a new dish, how do you begin creating that? Whether it's a cocktail, because I don't know, yeah, they do amazing cocktails. Um, cocktail or a dish. We, we, the, the philosophy is much the same for us in creating cocktails and in creating new dishes on the menu. I mean, wh one thing that we do is we work off a seasonal, sort of a seasonal calendar. As the fall comes, um, the fall vegetables uh, come in, the fall fruits come in, and so we start bringing those things into play. Uh, right now, corn is leaving. Um, Brussels sprouts just came on. So uh, Brussels sprouts are on it. We do a roasted Brussels sprouts dish, and that'll stay on for as long as the Brussels sprouts coming in from Half Moon Bay, then that'll go, and we'll go on to the next ingredient. Uh, in the in the making of the whole dish, um, for me, we have we have an open um, sort of palette as far as um, cultural inspiration. You know, I'm, our thinking is that you know the ocean is everywhere, so we we specialize <laughs> in seafood that those that might not know. Um, and so every culture and every culture uh, countries around the world have seafood dishes, pretty much. Um, so I think about that, and we'll have a dish right on the menu that's a, a Thai curry. Um, above that is a pasta. It's not like it's a traditional Italian-style pasta, but it could be. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be something that somebody made. In there. We have one now that's uh, prawns with uh, salami, and it used to have peas in it when peas were in season. Um, so we, we're mixing things around like that. The dish above that is a Nouveau Latino dish. Um, it's a mole with pineapple that would be served in the Yucatan. And the, all three dishes are on the same menu. So there's a full variety there. I just love that it's called the Walnut Creek Yacht Club. <laughs> well, we, we, we had a lot of thinking to do about it when we decided to go that way. And we didn't want to, we knew we were focused, our focus was to be seafood. Um, there was a real need for it in this market. And obviously it, it's, it stuck around because we've been here for, 18 years, um, and we wanted to create a restaurant that was um, stood on its own, so to speak, uh, and that people could feel like they were a part of, rather than, than just going in as a patron. Um, mm -hmm. And you needed to be a place that you could come to and have a birthday party, or an anniversary, or friends in from out of town, and it's a celebratory sort of dining out experience. But we also wanted to be a place where you could, your husband, wife would ever come home. You get home, you sit down, you go, I just want to go get some dinner. I just want swordfish, french fries. I don't need the whole culinary experience. I don't need a waiter <laughs> telling me all this stuff. I just want to get some dinner. And you can do that at a country club or yacht club. You know? So we, we toyed around with it. In the end, we thought, oh, well, you know, the, what comes out of the sea? Well, there's boats and sailing. And I had lived in the Caribbean for a long time. I had a lot of uh, sailing friends and experiences and been in a lot of yacht clubs, and we just kind of thought, well, you know, there's no farms in Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we decided we'd go with it. And it gave us our identity. 
It gave us our logo, it gave us our decor, it gave us our membership. We have almost 10,000 card-carrying members um, <laughs> now. Um, and people feel like, you know, they, I'm a member, I can come down. We have servers that have been there for dozens of years, so you feel familiar, it's comfortable. And so you can come in just for dinner, just for a dozen oysters, a salad, a glass of wine and go. Or you can bring in your friends celebrating an anniversary and have a whole celebratory time. And so the menu offers you these interesting dishes or just a piece of fish that's grilled simply, that's delicious and fresh and probably, the, you know, what you were, hopefully what you were looking for. Well, that's a great segue into the idea of community and a gather, restaurants as a gathering place. I, I do have a Walnut Creek Yacht Club anecdote to tell which is we were at a, the whole family was at a concert. We were celebrating. Um, our daughter is a composer. We had heard her piece, and we wanted to go get a drink afterwards. And did you know Walnut Creek rolls up the sidewalks at about 9.30? And so we walked in, and it must have been about two minutes till closing time. And we were a big group, and we were obviously very celebratory. You guys stayed for another hour. They popped the champagne. It was just... It was very much a feeling of here's a place to go and it's a community. Now you've got a new place, relatively yes. new, year and nine months. One year and nine months. Yes. Yeah. So how do you go about creating, like is that a goal or is the goal just to survive the opening of the restaurant? How do you create community in a restaurant? So my whole vision is to, uh, for Kanishkas is to set a whole socializing uh, ambiance. So the restaurant, you know, when I open Kanishka's, so have a whole, um, it's a gathering place. My vision is to, I love entertainment. So, so there's the turning the entertainment and bring it to Kanishka's. Bring my creativity of, you know, my passion is to cook, as been always, and I cook at home, and I love entertainment with my friends, family, and bring on that creativity and feed my guests. And when I'm at Kanishka's and my guests, whoever knows me, I love walking around and, you know, telling them about and make sure they are having an amazing time while dining at Kanishka's. Whether they are in a groups, families or friends or having a perfect date night, regardless of, you know, who they are. And that's my vision for Kanishka's going forward. We are one year, nine months and, you know, and, you know, obviously, you know, stepping into a restaurant as a, you know, first time restaurateur, there are many operational, you know, I encountered into, you know, making sure the, you know, cuisine is perfect, you know, operational challenges, going through it, you know, making sure there are, you know, obviously there are many, the most, most I would say, the challenge I would say is the labor that I encounter in this industry. And, um, and, my whole vision is to make sure as I move forward with Kanishka's is to deliver, you know, the more perfectionism and innovative, bring on the more innovative cuisine and uh, service, you know, perfection of service and, and in terms of the ambience. So as we grow forward with Kanishka's, be more renowned and recognized as one of the best restaurants in the Bay Area. So I can take Kanishkas to the next level. We have, you know, been entertained, you know, recognized and entertained, been entertaining in a lot of Napa events and weddings mm -hmm. in the wineries as, you know, of bringing in more like the tapas fusion with, you know, the yeah. execution. And it's challenging and that's where I am going for. Um, I am building my team, like I said, like it's not easy, nothing comes easy and it's hard. But, and we've been uh, working with my, you know, and my team is small as I said, mm -hmm. but whatever comes my way, you know, I, like, you know, like I've always stepped through and my dad has taught, dad has taught me that way. You know, take the challenge and, you know, gear yourself, gear yourself up and, and prepare yourself how to, you know, prepare in order to move towards the next steps. Totally. And not, you know, and you, you know, and, and you will be learning several lessons. Not everything will come out perfect. And not everything comes out perfect on every single thing. You know, you know there are many events that, you know, something, something or the other goes wrong. You know, there are, you know, good things happens, there are bad things happens. And I take the bad things and I learn, learn few 
lessons from there and I make sure those are not repeated next time. And that makes me and Kanishka's team move forward to the next steps. Good. Claudio. Yes. You are not off the hook there. The Italians are known for the, the whole idea of community and feasting that, that you guys don't eat and run. You guys have serious meals. How do you create that here? Well, I think that um, it's very important that you put your face and you communicate immediately with your customer or potential customer. Um, that's what I did, for example, with San Francisco. The first year I was there every night with my, my other two partners. And people, they like to know you. They want to know who you are, what you do, how do you uh, cook. Uh, they want to know the story behind uh, 54 Mint or behind uh, the Yacht Club. You know, that's very important. Um, and also, uh, I have to tell you that um, um, Americans, I, see, I am an American now, I am naturalized, but they, they travel more, they, they are a foodie person. I, I think that they, they don't know only fettuccine alfredo, they start to know a lot of different dishes, they have a good palate. If you explain to them, you, it's a matter of communicate. You know, if you communicate properly and word of mouth is the best tool that you can have. It takes longer, but it's, it's very solid. And uh, I do this, uh, with, I did with my first restaurant in San Francisco, I did with the Concord location, and I'm doing now in uh, Wano Creek. In fact, you know, some of the customers of Concord, they say, why you don't come anymore there? They go, because I have to take care of Wano Creek. So, you know, it's a little bit uh, difficult. Uh, Marcus Samuelson spends a lot of time talking about ingredients. I don't know if any of you guys made the mistake of reading this like before lunch. <laughs> it was painful. And he clearly has a thing for foie gras. He went on about that for just ages. Um, I actually ate at Red Rooster in Harlem last year. Killer, killer chicken and waffles with foie gras butter and a bourbon maple syrup. It was ridiculous. We couldn't really move afterwards. <laughs> Claudia, what's, what's the ingredient that obsesses you or that you like to play with most? Um, hmm. Italian uh, pork chick. Guanciale. Ah. Ah. It's fantastic. We call guanciale or uh, pancetta, but pancetta is the belly, it's different. Guanciale is the pork chick, it's fantastic, and you can do several dishes, from pasta to some roast meat where you use the fat of, uh, of the guanciale. And uh, I know some people, they look at me, uh, but it's great. You can make soups with that. Uh, there are some uh, very simple uh, potato soup with the spaghetti that you break in pieces, mm -hmm. but you make first a sofrito with uh, guanciale and uh, you use just vegetable broth, it's, it's, com it's coming out a soup that you will say, God made it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic, very simple. I love it. Can you explain to us what sofrito is? Sofrito is, um, it's very simple. You have to use extra virgin olive oil, you have to have a, a white onion, red, a red onion or yellow, whatever you, you have, Two couple, uh, two stalk of celery and one carrot. Of course, you have to peel a little bit the carrot, you know, to clean. You chop them very, very finely. You start the the range. You put the pot with the extra virgin olive oil and you put the sofrito. Sofrito is the base for many, many sauces. Is uh, the base for uh, the bolognese bolognese ragu. It's uh, the base for what we call sugo finto, that means uh, fake sauce. Fake sauce? Fake sauce, <laughs> yeah. That's the, literally the translation. And uh, it's a sauce um, that you made with a sofrito, and after you add uh, um, a bunch of different herbs and a tomato. And you, let, you, know, you let cook for uh, half an hour, and you have a fantastic uh, tomato sauce. So this is the sofrito. You can do sofrito also when you do a roast. You have to roast beef. You know, you prepare the sofrito and you put on top uh, the beef, white wine, and you bake in the oven. 
You can use a lot of things. I totally should have eaten dinner before I came. <laughs> okay. What are you passionate? What ingredient just gets you all thrilled? Well, um, for me personally, and then what I do yeah. for food-wise, sometimes <laughs> are different. Um, um, I, in the restaurant, I try to um, look at combinations of things. Um, since we're a seafood place, uh, I, one of the things I like to play around with is bringing in most often pork, either using chorizo or, or pancetta or bacon, and mixing it with seafood dishes. Um, and seeing, I, I do a lot of different things like that. And I also like to do a lot of, of hot and cold. Um, you know, there would be seared scallops on a salad or a cold puree. We were doing mint, an English mint uh, pea puree that was cold in the summertime with seared uh, with crab cakes on top of it. So, that sounds great. There's I probably, I mean, outside of chocolate, um, <laughs> you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty um, open. Um, there's a lot of things personally. You talk about foie gras, you know, a torchon of foie gras sliced on toasted you know, bread with a little mm -hmm. bit of sea salt. It's pretty spectacular stuff. I feel that way about a lot of charcuterie as well. I mean, uh, really nice um, prosciutto or jamón serrano from Spain. Um, you know, the salamis, um, those kinds of things are good ingredients that don't need to do much with, just eat them. <laughs> Again, outside of the chocolate. You know, chocolate, you can't go wrong with. Your turn. Okay. So, it depends on the, my mood, what I'm craving for. <laughs> so, um, I love uh, shrimp. So, um, so right now, um, month of September, let's just say, like um, I started playing, I wanted to introduce, you know, what I love cooking on special occasions, which is the East Indian like coconut shrimp curry, and I wanted my guests to enjoy. I actually had introduced that on Mother's Day, Father's Day last year, and everybody loved it, and I said like, why not, you know, why not bring it, you know, Friday, Saturday night. So I started introducing Friday, Saturday night. And my guest was like, okay, you do not have it on other nights. And they were sad about it. <laughs> so, okay, like now I do, I am serving every night of the week. And it is making to the menu. So that was a creation, authentic recipe from my grandfather. And my mother made it. And I'm making it. <laughs> so it is a raising based coconut curry sauce. And it's served with paratha, which is a grilled flatbread with no oil. And it is, um, you know, flavored with some paprika. It is simple and authentic. You know, some dishes needs to be left as simple as it without having the, you know, too much of the fusion twist. Other ingredients, you know, which I love playing with, you know, is like, you know, garlic. Garlic is one of my favorite <laughs> things. So start heating up the oil, temper it with some garlic, put in some fresh, uh, um, like whole masala. The base of the Indian spice, what we say, the whole garam masala, is five spice. Cardamom, cinnamon, cloves, bay leaves, cardamom, cinnamon, cloves, bay leaves, and uh, cinnamon. And as a Bengali, we always put sh like a little, uh, like a teaspoon of sugar to, you know, to create some flavor. After that, you could add anything, like whether you're making a curry or whether you're searing the meat. So once the oil is caramelized with this five spice, you could add onions and garlic and start searing the meat or you could add, you know, whether you're cooking lentils, it is going to add, you know, a whole different ball game to the flavor of your spices. So there is a, you know, whether I'm cooking, but, you know, to the, you know, to everyone in the whole room, there's a chef, you know, like who I, you know, I love to read her book. There's um, Madhur Jeffrey, you know, you may have all heard her mm -hmm. name. There's her book, like one spice, five, five spice. You know, to new newcomers, like you know, who are like, like simplicity of cuisine. Like, if you want to, like, take five spices and start creating some basic recipes, she's a great starter for everyone. And I myself also sometimes I don't like to cook like too much extravagant, even for the restaurant too. I've created recipes like using like two or three ingredients, like just garlic, onions, and creating one spice. 
and sometimes you, using like simplicity of spices have come up the best recipes Impl using even like fish dishes like temp you know um, heat up the oil put some garlic put some like black cumin seeds seared a fish like petrol so like um, you know dredged in some turmeric and some paprika and then you would serve that with some fresh salsa or something like that it's dishes like as you know an enjoy with some glass of wine it's as simple as could be I'm going to ask these guys just one more question and then open it up to you guys. I'm giving you fair warning so you can think of really good questions. Um, the thing about a dish that your grandfather made mm -hmm. reminds me how, and again, it's in the book as well, um, food speaks to us over the generations. We all have dishes that our grandparents made and that they comfort us and they connect us. What's What's a dish like that for you? Oh, mm, what would be a, well, there's, there's probably it's, it's several things. When we were growing up, I mean, it was more, it was more about getting, uh, just getting dinner on the table and getting four <laughs> kids to sit down and, and eat it. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, there are certain things. Um, we made a, um, a holiday potato pancakes, latkes with our family. Um, and so whenever you, you know, you do, you, you smell that smell, it will remind you of uh, that time. And cooking, it smells and memories. I mean, there's a lot of been written about it, how the smells can invoke um, some of the most powerful memories that you, you have. And you can relate that to food, taste is right along the same, same lines. So there's certain things that just happen and you remember but so there's certain smells like that like potato mm -hmm. potato pancakes frying um, uh, you smell that in the house and then you would know you know just remember all those times when the family was together and enjoying that yeah it's those kind of smells that I don't know it always makes me feel like somebody loves me oh, you know absolutely. like you walk into the house and you I smell mean the, the holiday time when you know you smell a turkey in your yeah in your house or just the smell of sage mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people can smell fresh sage and it'll evoke that period. Now, if you're the family that it's a bitter battle when everyone comes together, <laughs> then maybe you don't want to remember those things. But, but you know, sage is one of those herbs. It's very powerful. It also has a lot of um, you know medicinal stuff to it. Uh, Indians use it spiritually. So the, the, there's basil, another one. I mean, especially <laughs> with Italians, when you smell ba smell pesto, it, even in the winter, it will remind you of the summer. Um, yeah. You know things like that, or and it could remind you of a specific day or time that something happened when you were, you know, harvesting basil or picking tomatoes or, you know, would it be um, apples? I mean, they're d depending for whatever person, but smells and flavors can evoke really powerful memories. Yeah, Claudio. Yes. Well, um, I have to tell you that every time that I go back to to Italy. Uh, I do relate, as I said, you know, uh, tradition with uh, with uh, the smell. You know, mm -hmm. for me, it's perfume. I I start to think, oh, I remember when my mama used to do this this dish, and probably uh, I forgot. And so it it brings me back to memories. Um, in my house, I have to tell you that uh, the kitchen it's like. Uh, the kitchen of the restaurant. I bought the house six years ago. We changed two stove already. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Because we do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So it's always uh, uh, something. And we have a lot of friends coming over. So they want to, they are curious. They want to try. Excuse me? <laughs> What's your address? Three ones. <laughs> Let me tell you. My house is open. <laughs> oh, I love that. Does anyone have any questions besides what's your address? <laughs> yes. Uh, do you have the herb garden, fresh herb garden for your restaurant? The question is, I'm just going to repeat the question so everyone can hear. Um, does all of them or just all of them? Do you have a fresh herb garden for your restaurant? Um, we have uh, rosemary that we, that's on site that I use uh, during the fall and the winter. And um, we have a lot of guests that bring basil and things like that um, from their gardens. Um, but we don't have any specific uh, 
herb gardens growing in the, at the restaurant, bringing it in. Do you have an herb garden? So not for my restaurant, but I do have a, a lime leaf, a lemon leaves and lime leaves uh, tree in my house. So sometimes um, if I want to cook something special, so yes, Bring them in. I do. Nice. How about you, Claudia? I have rosemary in my house that we use and uh, also we do use a lot of stuff, especially on Sunday at the farmer's market. And uh, usually I buy for only for the East Bay location, so Concord and Walnut Creek. Um, sometimes uh, when we run out of, uh, of rosemary, I ask to my kitchen chef to go to steal. <laughs> there is a, to the city of Walnut Creek. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's tax. <laughs> it happens sometimes. <laughs> Yes. You talked earlier about uh, establishing a sense of community within the restaurant, and uh, kind of wanted to know what you do to establish a sense of community working with others. And something that kind of struck home with my wife and I as we were having breakfast at the coffee shop, and while we were there, we learned that pastry comes from 54 men. Yes. And so, like, in that relationship, did you search out other parties for this? Or uh, they, they, Let me they, just, sorry, just sorry. repeat the question. Um, he asked how, how Claudio goes about creating a sense of community within the kitchen, within the team, and others. Okay. Uh, with, uh, with Il Forno, 54 Mint Il Forno, basically the owners and the, the operator of uh, the, co the new coffee shop, they were regular customers. And we noticed that they were coming every day for a week. So with my partner, Daniele, they got something fishy. Either they want to see what, you know. And after they, pre they, they present themselves, uh, we, we are the, the new owners of the, this new coffee shop. We think that your pastry is fantastic. We would like to, to have your pastry in our coffee shop. And I said, OK. And uh, so this is a synergy, I think. It's very important. Uh, we do this, it's like a wholesaler for us, you know, it's very, it's very good. We do the same thing with, uh, if I may say the name, Massimo and uh, Katie's Creek mm -hmm. and um, Residual Sugar. So we do give them our stuff and they are, it seems very happy. How do you build so a team? So one of my um, main things, I, you know, I, um, you know, I promote artists, you know, every six months. You know, the artwork that is available in my mm -hmm. restaurant is I like to have artists, uh, Sokish, that bring us their portfolio to our restaurant. And I like to um, have them available and Sokish, you know, and this is all local Walnut Creek. Mm -hmm. So I like to have them available through a restaurant and Sokish it, you know, as a gallery and have it available for sale, whether it's local artists or whether it's renowned artists. So in that way, the diners get to enjoy while they are dining at my restaurant and also get to know about the artists. And, you know, I've reached out to Valley Arts, reach out to the local art galleries, and they also reach out to me. And this is a rotating every six months. Nice. And I um, host art and wine events for them. So it's reached out to, you know, broader way of community embracing what we do for them and you know and further and the other things is you know um you know it's like we host like tasting beer and wine tastings events mm -hmm. so uh, the community gets to know more about kanishkas and we provide you know some tasting orders and it's like alternative months um so the local um, wineries, um, sometimes local, sometimes it's more like the boutique wineries comes and participates and Kanishkas provides a tastings of uh, tapas for the community locals to come and enjoy my cuisine. Did you want to? Um, well, as far as the community goes, I mean, we, we're, being a restaurant business, um, you're constantly being look at for a donation of some kind or another to <laughs> some other cause or another and there's uh, and it, it's 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 never ending and over the years you know we've we, we've championed a few um, that we are sort of um, tied to uh, the Oakland's Children's Hospital um, we do several uh, events with them 
uh, Score for Kids, uh, their program. All of the local Walnut Creek School District elementary schools, um, we participate in their fundraisers, either by offering um, things that they can auction off. I do, um, I do a kids cooking school um, every summer um, for kids from 6 to 13. Um, and it's over, we've done it for, for years now. I have kids that, are, that were in it when they were young and are now in college. But um, <laughs> so those kinds of things, you know, we bring the, our, you know, our community in. We have a newsletter that goes out every month that keeps people posted on uh, what's going on and what we can do and, you know, that kind of thing. I'll bet those kids who took the cooking class and are now in college are making their roommates extremely yeah, happy. Was my nephew, as he grew up, uh, <laughs> learning to cook with me in the kitchen. He, he, his college roommates just were like, what's for dinner? <laughs> this, this, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, what about with social media right now? Are you using Instagram and you have a Facebook page? Are you trying to put things on Twitter to get people excited about what you're... So the questions about social media and how they're using it, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook? We've been a big... Uh, player in social media since its inception, since we started before any of that was even happening. And we grew along with it. My partner, Ellen, um, she's sort of our social media maven, uh, looks after all of that. So, and it's a, it's a big thing now. And it requires a lot of time. Um, because once you start to connect to people through social media, as far as they're concerned, they're, we're friends. We're, I mean, it's not <laughs> Facebook friends. I know you. And um, if you, if, so it's, it's, you have to keep up on the posts. And we do a lot of um, food photography of what's going on in the kitchen. We put up videos of things, um, events at the, that are going on in the restaurant. We're using Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, um, all of those mediums. And I think to, in today's restaurant business especially, it's incredibly important, especially when you're dealing with Yelp on the other side, um, you know, where it's an open forum to say whatever you want about whatever you feel, whether it's true or not. And it's a difficult medium to, to, to battle. So we try to keep the whole positive thing going on the social media so people that know us know what's going on. Claudia, do you use social media for...? Um, not enough. Uh, we should probably do a better job. Uh, I agree 100% with Amy. It requires a lot of time yeah. and dedication. Probably in order to do something very nice and professional, you need a person that will work at least uh, three, four, five hours a week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are using right now Instagram and uh, Facebook for the... San Francisco uh, and uh, Il Forno. We have been a little bit sloppy on the Concord mm -hmm. location, but now we are going to have somebody that will uh, work out properly. Good. Yeah, so we managers, you know, Kanishka's Gastropubs, uh, with, you know, very active on the social media that, you know, I think, you know, being coming from a tech, you know, technology background, I think, you know, we have to keep up with the trend. Um, you know, it's technology is running completely, and I think the whole restaurant industry, you know, is, is you know, running with the chase at this point. <laughs> you know, all, a lot of the restaurants are even using iPads, you know, the customers want uh, experience, you know, you want the orders to be fast. You want the customer orders to be taken with the, I, you know, iPad, you know, iPhone technology. People want to pay now with the open table you know, even check-ins and check-outs. Yes. So you have to, you know, constantly keep up with the trend. So yes, to that question. Yes. So we are using Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and, you know, it is challenging enough, you know, but yes, so we are constantly keeping up to the trend with the posts, you know, keeping up with the diners, uh, you know, responses uh, as much as possible, you know, so, you know, so, you know, it is the accountability for us to make them feel comfortable you know, to positive and negative reviews, uh, or what the asks are, what they are craving for. Because as a chef, you know, I think it's, I think I feel that, you know, in order to deliver the experience that, what I, my vision is to bring to Kanishka is that I think that, okay, if they're craving to, 
you know, for something, some type of craft beer or some type of cuisine, this is, I think it's my, you know, accountability and this is forthcoming in the next few months to set the stage so they know, okay, over the few months, I will be going to Kanishka's to dine. So, and the other thing is, yes, we act, you know, we completely manage the reservations, are driving through Open Table, Yelp, um, Food Spotting is coming up, Urban Spoon, trip, you know, Trip Advisor is coming up there. Yes. Uh, the question is, Everybody. why is it called 54 Mint? Everybody's always asking me that. <laughs> it's a very short story. Uh, when we signed the, the lease for San Francisco, you know that area, 54 Mint, uh, used to be called Jesse Street, used to be a shortcut for Mission to and the Market Street and vice versa. So anyhow, they... Um, we signed the lease and the, the address was uh, six, uh, 54 Mint Street at that time. As soon as we signed the lease, the city hall of uh, San Francisco, they called, uh, every, they changed everything and they said six, uh, 16 Mint Plaza. So they changed the address. So <laughs> I was born in 1954. I like the idea because I like to confuse people. Usually <laughs> an Italian restaurant you see mangia bene, pasta, pane. No, 54 meat, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Where do you obtain your fish, and are they all sustainable? Uh, the question's about where, where do you get your fish, and is it sustainable? Yeah, we use um, only sustainable fisheries. Um, sustainability is a big word with a lot of definitions, depending on who you talk to. Um, there's a seafood company in San Francisco called Osprey Seafood. My brother-in-law um, owns it. Um, they've been in business for uh, quite a few years, longer than we have. So we we started knowing. Well, you know, my brother-in-law has got uh, a reputation already of having high high quality white tablecloth seafood. Um, so we were going to do that as a restaurant. It's pretty good because we can ex exclusively buy our seafood from them, and I don't have to worry about different suppliers and weights and so forth, all, all the different uh, aspects and buying from people that you don't really know until you build a relationship with over. So we've used them exclusively the whole time. You can look at the Monterey Seafood Watch and you can read into to what they have to say. Um, there's Ocean Watch, Earth, there's, there's dozens of different places. And you might look at Monterey and they'll say, oh, line caught, mahi mahi is good, but you know, this isn't. But if you go to another guy, he's going to say, yeah, that one's good. So you really got to talk to the people in the industry, find out exactly where the fish is coming from, who's catching it, and how they're catching it. And we do that on a daily basis. Cool. We've only got time for a couple more questions, right? Two questions? Um, yes. Uh, I've absolutely loved listening to all of you. I want to just rush back and go to each of your restaurants right away. Um, so thank you very much. I'm wondering, and I don't want to put you on the spot, if you read the book, if there is one thing from Marcus Samuelson that you know really stuck with you, that you really appreciated or could um, identify with. So the question is, if they read the book, which I don't think they did. No. Okay, then I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. Uh, there's been several excerpts from the book. I I'm and follow a lot of um, chef websites and newsletters and things that are passed around by culinary professionals. And there was a lot of hype and talk yeah. about the book when it came out. Um, you know, he's a very well-known guy, uh, and there, there's some stuff that I read about it that's spot on. I mean, I, I can relate to him, um, you know, he came up the hard way working in kitchens like I did, learning, going to culinary school where you could get as much education on it, but you had this drive to be in a kitchen and work hard and, you know, keep going up to the top, and so those kinds of things that, he, you know, he talked about, I think you mentioned it what we were talking earlier of being a control freak. Um, you know, when you're on a kitchen, you, you want everything, and he knows a lot. It's your name, your reputation is at, at stake. So, yeah, and, qu quick That's answer. Right. Yeah, there's right. a lot of things as a working professional that I relate to. Great. Thank you very much. One last, yes. When you're traveling, what kind of a restaurant will you choose to go to, and how do you decide? Oh, such a good question. When they're traveling, how do they decide? I'm assuming you don't have time to go out to dinner here. So, <laughs> aside from your restaurant, so when you're traveling, 
how do they decide where to dine? What are they looking for? Go ahead. When I travel, I'm looking to get as local as possible. I'm not, you know, obviously through the internet, you can find out a lot of stuff about what's popular. Depending if I'm looking for a high-end culinary experience, um, which there's fabulous restaurants all over the world. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to dine at El Bulli in Spain, which is considered one of the greatest restaurants in the world. But the next day, we went to a small little teeny restaurant that I'd heard about that is not frequented by, you know, the tourist trade. So I look for both kinds of experiences. Same here. So like when I'm dining, um, when I'm traveling, so that's where I look for the experience. I look for like absolute like street style food. I know I, I completely travel like a local. So I look for street style experiences. Even I have gone to you know, ask the, you know, the cab driver to sometimes takes me to people home and really had a home style cuisine experience. If, you know, and that I have done in some foreign countries. You know, and that type of cuisine I've really not experienced in ever. So that I've done in Caribbean. And also I've done in top chef restaurants in France and, you know, many other, you know, foreign, um, like, you know, Spain, Italy, that have given me the whole vision of how the cuisine can, you know, expand from, you know, from presentation to exquisite to the different flavors. And sometimes, like, you know, you know, I will be really surprised that sometimes, you know, sometimes the top chefs could bring out the best of flavors. Sometimes the simplicity home cook could come out to bring the best of cuisine. And that's what inspired. I love it. Brings the inspirations. Claudio. Well, for me, there are two types of traveling. Either it's pleasure or business. So that means that you have to approach the food in a different way. This is my opinion. So I go local, like uh, my two colleagues here, and uh, you know I walk around. I see you know when you are on on uh, on leisure, uh, you have to be relaxed. You know, if you start to look at Yelp or all <laughs> the things, please. No, just walk around if you have an idea of what you're going to have. Of course, I'm not looking for Italian uh, food if I go, I don't know, in Thailand or somewhere else. I go local. Basically, I go local, yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Are we? The lady with the microphone is glaring. <laughs> oh, please join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you.